I'd never experienced an organizational uh, a structure to the mob where they would track things. They would confer on Reddit and they would say, here's how we're going to get him. Here's how we're going to organize. Here's how we're going to pool resources. Here's how we're going to suppress his supporters. Here's how we're Jeez. going to get him off the internet. Here's how we're going to get his license removed. Here's how we're going to get him fired from his university. Here's how we're going to... That is insane. Yeah. No, it, it is. Um, and I got a light version of it. <laughs> Are you going through life blind? This is Eyes Wide Open with Nick Thompson. On this podcast, we share knowledge and stories that build human connection while elevating stigmatized societal issues such as mental health, holistic wellness, culture, free speech, and more. All to ensure we show up in the world with our eyes wide open. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Eyes Wide Open. Our guest today is a licensed therapist, professor, and the host of Psychology in Seattle. He is a new friend, I would say that I've recently connected with, and we connected over some of the stuff going on in, in my life and in reality TV and starting uh, the UCAN Foundation. But when I was talking with Dr. Kirk a couple of weeks ago for his show, his podcast, Psychology in Seattle, he shared with me an experience he had last year on his coverage with Amber Heard and Johnny Depp. So he provided some commentary. And one of the reasons I like Dr. Kirk, in all honesty, is when I've seen some of the videos and the content he's produced out there, I feel like he is very compassionate. I feel like he's very empathetic. And I feel like he is non-judgmental, which is very rare when someone's commenting on um, you know, culture, reality TV. Everybody seems to put their opinion in whether or not they're a mental health professional. So his coverage and the things he's talked about has really helped me. Um, you know, believe that, that he's a good person and that he is doing good work. And he's really trying to help people understand what's going on or could be going on more. His coverage of Amber Heard and Johnny Depp actually led him to basically become a victim of an online bully mob that was coming at him from both sides, um, the Johnny Depp side, the Amber Heard side, to the point where they were organizing against him on social media. And he eventually was forced to make some changes in his personal life that we'll get into in this interview. But I wanted to share this interview because there is a dark side of the internet and it is that online bully mob. And I've experienced it myself. Dr. Kirk's experienced it. I know a lot of people in my life now that have experienced it. And I really want to talk about the impacts that that has on someone because um, I've experienced it myself. And then hearing Dr. Kirk's story inspired me to reach out uh, to have him on this interview. So Thank you. I hope you enjoy this episode. Let's get to our interview with Dr. Kirk Honda. Our guest today is licensed therapist, professor, and the host of Psychology in Seattle. Thank you for joining. This is Dr. Kirk Honda. How are you today? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm doing just fine. Thank you. Appreciate having you on. I know we talked a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. um, for your show, which was which was a really good conversation too. So thanks mm -hmm. for returning the favor. Yeah. I wore my uh, "Don't Be a Jerk Face" shirt for in honor of today's topic. I love that. Thank you. Before we get into it, I, I started asking people this question because I'm so curious about the answers. What did you want to be when you were growing up, and how did that evolve and change to where you are? I wanted to be an astronomer because, as a young person in the mid '70s, I was fascinated with astronomy and. Astro I didn't want to be an astronaut. I, I don't know why. I mean, that certainly was a big part of the seventies with the Apollo program, mm -hmm. but I found a book in the library when I was, I think in kindergarten, I found it again. It's called stars. And I actually, it's on, it's behind me on the, which I was this tiny little paperback. And it's funny because at the time we didn't know that much about the solar system or the galaxy or the universe. Mm -hmm. So it's funny looking through it, but I was just so, I didn't know exactly what I was looking at, but I was just so fascinated. And then in high school, when uh, we had career day, they, they had these three ring binders. This is before the internet. So you could flip through different professions. And when I got to the astronomy section, it said that in the United States, there were one to two new job openings for astronomers every year. Wow. 
And it was because someone either died or they retired. And so I thought, huh. Now, I think they were actually talking about professor astronomies, astronomers, uh, and not necessarily like research assistants and this kind of thing. But it it turned me off because I thought, well, that doesn't sound like a very good career choice. <laughs> right. And so I didn't know what to do beyond that. And it, it, then in my mid twenties, I decided to become a therapist. Okay, that's so fascinating and pretty much in line with what I see from other guests. They, everyone, when you're a kid, you have like these grand dreams of what you're going to be when you grow up, and then you just slowly get whittled into, I like to say, capitalism. But they just kind of funnel you into capitalism, and and um, you know, you bucked the trend a little bit, I would say, uh, by becoming a therapist. But that's that was uh, so. What, what was your undergrad then? It was in business because my sister got a business degree and I did a lot of things that she did because she seemed to know what she was doing. And with business, I figured, you know, a lot of things involve business. So maybe it'll, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but maybe it'll come into play. And then when I decided to go into private practice after getting my master's degree and later my doctorate, I put that degree to use, you know, marketing and accounting and business planning and all that stuff. Yeah, it is interesting. Like I have a marketing background too, and I'm so, I'm much better at marketing other stuff than myself or my own things, but it is such a good foundation to have, you know, just the basics of how to run a business or what needs to go into it. I think for like everyone should probably yeah. be important, especially in today's economy, when you have so many people that are in the gig economy or working mm -hmm. even as creators or, or content producers, like you've been, you've been doing for a long time. It was 2008, right? Was when you started the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. And you're also a professor. So what do you teach and where do you teach? If you want to share that? Sure. I teach counseling therapy, marriage and family therapy, individual therapy at Antioch university in Seattle. What was your initial start to your podcast? Like, what was your goal? Because I had heard on one of your shows that you even stopped at one point because it wasn't growing, it wasn't going anywhere, and then you started back up again. I didn't stop because it wasn't growing. I It wasn't growing. <laughs> that's, not, <laughs> that's not why I stopped. I stopped because I was actually going back to school to get my doctorate and uh, was uh, didn't have time. So mm -hmm. um, that's why I, or no, wait. I'm wrong. I stopped it because I went full time at the university. So I've been teaching as a as an adjunct for about 10, 15 years or okay. 10, maybe 10 years. And then I transitioned to full time. And so uh, that takes a lot of time. And so I didn't have have time to do the podcast. But originally, I was obsessed with audiobooks, And then I was obsessed with public radio, like This American Life. I mm -hmm. loved the, that kind of intimate uh, amateur, it feels amateur, even though this American life isn't amateur, but it, it felt down to earth. It felt exploratory and creative. And then when podcasts came out, I was obsessed with podcasts. And incidentally, I listened to a lot of astronomy podcasts back then. <laughs> uh, and I still, together. I still do. Yeah. And, uh, cause there, you know, anyway, point is, is that I was listening to a lot of science podcasts and, I thought, and I'm always this way. I don't, it's a little bit of a narcissistic streak of, could I do that? <laughs> you know, yeah. um, I have a friend who's more narcissistic than I am. And when we'll, we'll go to a show like a, a band or a, some kind of performance and he'll be next to me in the audience. And he always turns to me and he'll be like, I could do that. I, maybe I should do that. You know, there's this <laughs> compulsion to be on stage. I'm less so that way. But anyway, so I was listening to podcasts and I just thought, could I do that? And I was at the time listening to, there were only three other psychology podcasts in, in, the, English oh, wow. in the English language podcasting universe. And so I thought, well, if I made a podcast, I'd literally be the fourth best psychology podcast in the world. Out of the gate. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, you know, pretty low bar of, of entry. And I had already, you know, as a musician, I had all this uh, equipment and a, you know, and I'm also a producer of a sort, like a music producer, and so mm. it wasn't hard for me to just co-opt all that equipment and know-how to just start making an audio or a video and audio podcast. Oh, that's awesome! And you are now primarily. I, I've listened to a couple of your things, but you cover some reality TV. Um, you also just cover more general topics. You answer questions. How would you describe your content and your strategy and, and what you're trying to contribute? 
Oh, well, I'm kind of a grab bag of a lot of things, as you're saying. I also do a lot of deep dives on particular topics. Um, you know, I'll, I'll spend a few months investigating a theory or a, a phenomenon, and I will, uh, you know, talk about it a lot on the, you know, in the audio podcast, particularly. So yeah, I, I, I just, I want to, I, when I started out, I wanted to make a psychology podcast that was entertaining and interesting. And I guess I didn't intend on this, but it kind of became this at times where it's moving. You know, there are times where right. we have genuine emotional experiences together. Um, and people will, you know, say that they were crying while they were listening and it was um, transformative for them in some ways. As a podcast listener myself, I, I still mm -hmm. listen to about five, six hours of podcasts a day because <laughs> I yeah, me too. I <laughs> do. I'm not alone. Uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll just be walking out to the car to get something and I'll put my earbuds in and listen to yeah. some, you know, I'm just, I'm always like, Ooh, way. I could, you know, I'm like, I don't want to just be walking. I want to be walking and listening. Um, I've been moved by a lot of things as well. Um, this American life, other, other kinds of podcasts. And so, yeah, that, that's my intention is to make it entertaining mm -hmm. and informative podcast. When we were talking a couple of weeks ago, you had said that, and I didn't know this. I had I started following you a little bit in the fall, which we talked about um, on your coverage from my season of Love is Blind. Mm -hmm. And I found it very personal. I found it very personable, too, I would say. And, and you were approaching your commentary with such like a gentleness that when you watch some other people's commentary, even those in the mental health field, whether they're counselors, psychologists, or whatever, you don't really get that, like authenticity that genuineness coming through all the time and a lot more times they're they're kind of like judging people mm. um which i think is you know we're we all judge a little bit but i really like that about your show and i think that's what makes it different and stand out but you had some coverage that you were sharing with me that you did on the johnny depp and amber heard case mm. so i listened to some of it um i I personally don't understand what you did wrong, but I'm curious in your words, what was your thoughts when you decided I'm going to cover this and maybe talk a little bit about, you know, what the outcome was? I uh, tend to do what the fans want me to do. <laughs> so, uh, Gotta listen to your audience. Uh, yeah. A lot of people were asking me to react to the coverage of the trial and I just thought, nah, I don't know if I have a, I'm always thinking, do I have a voice to offer to the internet? You right. know, is there, cause I don't want to just create content, just me reacting to something like, whoa, and, and not have any expertise to offer or a point mm -hmm. of view to offer. Uh, so a lot of things I, I just say, well, you know, I appreciate that you're interested in what I would have to say about this, but I just don't feel like it would be a valuable thing to put out there, but yeah. So at first I thought the trial would be that way, that I would just be reacting and going, well, that's shocking. And Ooh, that's, you know, I, I don't know. It's just not really my sort of content. But then a psychologist started giving their te testimony. And I, I watched a little bit of that because I was getting flooded with emails mm -hmm. and I thought, huh, you know what? I, I could maybe react to her testimony because it has to do with forensic psychology, which I'm trained as a forensic psychologist. And, and so can you explain what that is too? Yeah. It's where as a psychologist, you are hired to investigate a question, uh, for the purposes of the court. Usually it can be other reasons, but mm. you sometimes are asked to determine if someone was insane at the time of the crime or that they're competent enough to stand trial or, whether or not they have a disorder because with Amber Heard, she was claiming she had PTSD as a result of her relationship right. with Johnny Depp. And so because of that claim, it becomes a question that can be evaluated by each uh, yeah. legal team. And so each legal team hires their own forensic psychologist to investigate certain claims that are being made in the civil suit. Cause it was a, it was a, uh, they were both suing each other at the same mm -hmm. time. So it was a, I didn't really follow it until after, but it was like a double defamation, right? They were accusing each other of defamation. Yeah, and technically they both won <laughs> to, yeah. different, to different degrees. I uh, watched this morning to prep for this. I, I listened um, to your YouTube recap of the 
um, the outcome. And that was like, oh, I actually didn't know that she won yeah. too. I really didn't pay that close of attention. Yeah, I mean, technically she won uh, a defamation suit against his lawyer, not against Johnny Depp himself. But anyway, uh, so um, so I started watching that because I thought, you know, I, I could comment on that. And then there was a huge response. Uh, lots of people asking me to cover the entire trial. And so I started doing that. Anyway, I just provide my take. I, I don't manufacture my take. I have a take. Right. <laughs> I, I, I say it. You, you know, you were saying earlier about how uh, compared to other reaction videos that you were watching, I uh, maybe was a little bit more personable or something. And yeah, and um, yeah, uh, I, I, it's a stick of mine. It's a value of mine. It's a, uh, I'm a superpower. Well, I, I'm I'm committed to. <laughs> Uh, being non-judgmental to mm -hmm. looking for the compassionate explanation as to why people do things. Cause uh, as a therapist, I've learned that that usually is the, the best answer. It's usually the most accurate answer. Seemingly it's the most helpful answer. It's the most optimistic answer. When I think it's, it's the most honest answer too. That's yeah. 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 Uh, it, it's not clouded by defenses and, my own insecurities or whatever. Right. So when I watch these reality TV shows, I just would react normally. And I didn't realize that a lot of people were reaching out to me saying like, you're so wholesome. You're like Mr. Rogers and stuff. And I, I thought, <laughs> I am not Mr. Rogers. I, 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 if you knew me, I'm not Mr. Rogers, but uh, compared to other people, maybe even other clinicians online, I don't know. Um, I was. And so anyway, I'm watching the trial and I, I have my take, which there's another side of my philosophy, which is that, and I've learned this by working with clients, is that when I hear two people conflicting, they have a, a fight or they have a long relationship or a past relationship, Johnny Depp, Amber Heard. I'm a marriage therapist, so I you know I hear this all the time. Um, uh, for example, with couples, they'll come in and they'll talk about a fight they had the night before, and I will hear completely different stories. And long story short, uh, what I've learned is that we uh, not only perceive things emotionally, but we remember things and recall things emotionally. So we don't record reality in an objective way, like a video recording or something. Right. We, we uh, pay attention to certain things, we emphasize, we distort, and particularly if we have a lot of relational traumas growing up. So I've learned that it's hard, it's impossible for me to know as a couples therapist. And of course I have hours and hours of time to investigate, to ask questions, to get a mm -hmm. sense of what really happened. And I concluded a long time ago that I'll never know, you know, I could take my best right. guess, but I'll never know. So when I'm watching this trial and I've been a part of these uh, things before divorces, not only in court and out of court professionally, but um, I just have a philosophy that, I don't know. I, I, you know, yeah. it, it kind of looks like this, but there's no way for me to know. And I've learned before, I've been burned that if I like commit and I'm hundred percent sure almost all the time, something comes up where I'm like, Ooh, I was wrong. I was so wrong. I'm always extremely tentative. And I, and I speak from that. So when I was watching the trial, I was um, saying, well, okay, she's making this claim. <clears throat> if that's, and what I would, I always use it as a jumping off point. That's what I do with the with the reality TV, because <clears throat> I don't know if any of the reality TV is real. You know, it could be all manufactured. I can tell you most of it's not. <laughs> right. It could be scripted-ish, or uh, the even the cast members could be putting something out there. So uh, if I depended on things to be exactly real, then I'll have nothing to say because I don't know what's real, but I can use mm -hmm. it as a jumping off point. So with Amber Heard, she'd be accusing Johnny Depp of something, and then I would say, well, if that's true, then here's my experience working with people who actually have had that happen to them. Or here, here's what PTSD is. Here's what borderline personality is. Here's what histrionic. Um, one psychologist is saying that she does have borderline. Another psychologist is saying she doesn't have borderline. I don't know. I wasn't there. I haven't looked at the testing. I don't know Amber Heard. But for clients that I've worked with that have borderline or clients that I've worked with who have had a partner who had borderline... Here's what I can say. And that's what I did. So mm -hmm. it's just so objective. That's such a fair, objective way to look at it, which is why I, I thought you had some crazy hot take that I was going to be like, okay, but it doesn't. But then again, 
yeah. 99.9999% of people online, according to my observation and a lot of people telling me, uh, including clinicians, by the way, were landing on one side or the other. And not only landing on pro Amber Heard or pro Johnny Depp, but right. they were ridiculing the other side and saying, if you're supporting Johnny Depp, then you're a narcissist. If you're supporting Amber Heard, then you're borderline or whatever. And there were just a lot of things that were being, there was a lot of attacking online. And so- Well, and the weaponization of their mental health too is- Yeah. Uh, I, nothing bothers me more than seeing uneducated people diagnosing people they don't know. Like- Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, people will, ac will accuse me of diagnosing people online. Uh, but I don't, I'm, I'm always clear about that. Um, there might be times when I don't emphasize the tentativeness enough, which I'll take responsibility for, but, hmm. um, but I'm very careful to not, cause I philosophically know that there's no way for me to do that. When I do, uh, diagnose people in my office, I have the benefit of, you know, years of time with them mm -hmm. to be able to hone in on something, particularly something like a personality disorder. Anyway, so I started to get attacked uh, online oh. by both sides. So the pro Amber Heard side, and no one was in the middle, seemingly. <laughs> so, um, now I will say there was a silent majority of people who were either, you know, leaning Amber Heard or leaning Johnny Depp, right. who absolutely were okay with what I was saying, but they're not very vocal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the thing. They're so, the ones that, yeah, don't have the extreme opinion to feel they need to be vocal. Yeah. yeah. And certainly, you know, as a podcaster for uh, almost 15 years now, I've experienced online bullying and criticism and, and hatred and death threats and, you know, all sorts of things. So, uh, but this was different. This was the first time when I truly understood what people like you go through as a more famous person <laughs> who experiences this crowd organized, you know, it's one thing if someone just comments and says, you're a jerk face, I don't like you read a book, go back to school, Get you're a, a terrible job. clinician, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you signed um, up for it. <laughs> it doesn't feel good. And it's awful. No. And it, it will plague me and keep me up at night. But it's mm -hmm. another I'd never experienced an organizational uh, a structure to the mob, where they would track things, they would confer on Reddit, and they would say, here's how we're going to get him. Here's how we're going to organize. Here's how we're going to pool resources. Here's what we need to do. Here's how we're going to suppress his supporters. Here's how we're Jeez. going to get him off the internet. Here's how we're going to get his license removed. Here's how we're going to get him fired from his university. Here's how we're going to- That is insane. Yeah, no, it, it is. Um, and I got a light version of it. <laughs> um, uh, people like yourself and even people involved with the trial. I mean, there were forensic psychologists who were just doing their job, hired by one right. side or the other, providing their testimony, who experienced, I think, millions of people going after them. Mm -hmm. um, so this was the first time where that happened, and it was rough. <laughs> how, how were those threats coming in, or did you just monitor them on Reddit? How did you find out? I don't go on Reddit. I forget a lot of people do. I can't do Reddit, but... Um, for these reasons, I like to be ignorant to some of that stuff. But how did you discover that it was getting so organized and serious? Well, I love Reddit, but I like my certain subreddits that I like to go to, mm -hmm. <laughs> where it's not like what I'm talking about. But um, how did I find out? I found out because, you know, emails, people would um, comment below that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Uh some people would alert me. They would say, so I got to tell you, there's this group of hundreds of people in this subreddit who have uh, put you on a list. There was a hit list, essentially, of, of different different people who were, um, uh, and, and, and long story short, when I would look at the conversation about me, it looked like literally no one had actually watched my content. <laughs> Because if they had, that's the case. They would be hard pressed to find something that was obviously a problem for me. You know what I mean? Right. And I don't blame them because I I produced over I think seventy hours of content on, <sighs> on the trial alone. 
So Whoa. I don't blame them for not watching, but I do blame them for assuming that because one of the people in their in-group had identified me as the enemy, none of them actually looked into me and actually found out what I was saying, because I'm pretty sure, because I was being lumped in with a group of people that were not uh, like me. They, they, they were people that were clearly on one side or the other. And I'm like, I'm not on one side. Or the other. I, right. I, I, I'm on both of their sides, I guess, because that's how I am as a marriage therapist is I'm, I'm on both people. I'm like, okay, you're both suffering. Uh, you're both misunderstanding each other. Let's try to work anyway. So, um, yeah, I became aware of it because people would, people were worried for me. <laughs> they would say, yeah. uh, cause normally I don't really try to look into stuff. You know, I, I just pay you attention. Can't. Yeah. You'll spend your whole life feeling like you did for this. If you read too much into it, yeah. it's brutal. Yeah. So, it, you know, it, you know what this is like, Nick, it affected my sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, it freaked me out. I started to become demoralized for, the, you know, again, I, at that point I'd been podcasting for 14 years, had right. never really had a, a hiccup regarding motivation or demoralization. And during that, that spring, it was exactly a year ago, I started to seriously question whether or not I wanted to even do any of this stuff, you know, cause it, it was, it's sort of like, you know, if you've never, for the people listening, if you've never been in this position, the closest thing I can think of is say you have a job and you're working with, uh, you know, 40 people or something and you start and you're gung ho and, you know, you feel good and you're trying and, and you're, you're uh, putting effort into it and you have optimism. And then all of a sudden something happens. The, a group of people or your boss and their boss, suddenly you become aware that they're against you. They don't like you. They think you're stupid or incompetent or uh, they're just on a baseline level not only do they not like you, but they're working against you. And mm -hmm. imagine waking up in the morning and you want to feel good about going to work. And, and, and eight hours a day of work requires a lot of motivation, a lot of energy, a lot of, um, you know, you have to believe and trust the people around you. And you're just driving to work and, and you're not sure if something bad is going to happen, but you don't really know. And, and it doesn't feel good. And so I, I've been in that position before and you, you just want to quit. You just want to yeah. start over. You know, I can't imagine what you went through and what you're still going through. <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> yeah, and I also I can't that. imagine what women go through because they empirically get this. So times much 10. worse. Yeah. It's so much worse. It's so I remember worse. seeing some of the stuff when the show when love is blind first came out um and I, it was appalling i can't believe the things that people think it's okay to do just because they're behind a keyboard yeah. and the things that they say that just cut people in just for the sake of doing it it's awful and i worry when i see this because even if someone has insecurities that they've worked through or are working through and you decide to share your life with the public or share your content with the public or put that little piece of yourself out there and then to have like every possible insecurity just scrutinized or to be, were you ever doxxed? Like, did they get your home address or anything like that? That's got to be terrifying. I don't remember that. I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't remember that. But yeah, that's... Uh, threats and indications of of real threat of violence, real risk of violence. Um, yeah, I invested in a very well. I I have two security systems on my house, <laughs> so just <laughs> just so you know. Um, and I'm obsessed with it because it's scary, you know, to yeah. the amount of anger. Now, I will say that a year later, uh, I'm much better now. <laughs> it took me a while to recover, but I've done a lot of talking about it. I've, I've you know, talked with people. I've cried about it. I I've have um, vented a lot. I've done what I can to make myself feel safe. I've also committed to not covering topics like that. Yeah. Um, 
because it's not worth it. Um, so they won. The bullies won. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I'm fine. Yeah. You know, I, I don't mind them winning because I don't want to. I don't even want to be on their radar. But I still am. Right. I still am on their radar. They still. You know these online mobs. I, I just don't get how people, I guess it's mob mentality, right? You get a little caught up in it and now it just happens on Reddit instead of, you know, the town square, I guess. But it's, it's crazy to me to try and comprehend like what is going on in someone's head that they would want to hurt someone because of content or more importantly, that they would be trying to get your license, like literally trying to ruin your life without even watching your videos without even listening to your your take whether they agree or disagree what is it with people that makes them think that's the answer violence doxing um you know projecting name calling all of that stuff yeah this is a well-known phenomenon that's been studied for centuries observed for centuries it's just online now um mm -hmm. it, it was uh, perhaps harder a few decades ago to do something like this because uh, where would you notice a mob happening? Now you could go further back in time and probably had a greater chance of seeing a mob because you lived in smaller communities. I don't know, but yeah, it's a, it's a human tendency. Um, I think one of the, there's a lot of different theories about it, but, and I could ramble for a long time, but the one thing that I'll, I'll highlight is that, there's a lot of people who are very hurt, right? Hurt people, hurt people, right? And they don't look like hurt people. They don't even necessarily know they're hurt people, you know? And what does a hurt person even look like, right? So uh, there's so much pain and so much trauma and so much insecurity and so much uncertainty and fear and loneliness and they don't know what to do. They don't have a mm -hmm. way out. They don't even know necessarily that they're suffering but they are definitely. And yeah. um, then, and they cope with it in a variety of ways. They smoke pot every day. They drink every day. They, um, I don't know, lose themselves down a rabbit hole online. They become mm -hmm. obsessed with the flat earth theory or whatever. There's, there's various ways in which people will distract themselves or find community. You know, it's another thing mm -hmm. is finding community. Um, and there's a subset of these individuals that will, find themselves just obsessing and really thinking about a particular topic, right? Or really identifying with a particular in-group. And it feels good and it occupies the brain and it gives them purpose. It gives them a direction. It gives them a distraction. It gives them a target uh, to go after because they've been harmed in their life and they don't necessarily have an enemy that they can identify. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was one of their parents and they don't want to do that because they're, they're still trying to get their parents to love them or something. You know, there's a lot of different paths to this, but yeah. they don't know who to attack. They're, they know there's something wrong, but they, they don't know who they're supposed to go after. Well, uh, then someone like you come along <laughs> and I've observed this as well, that, cause I've seen this many times happen to many people online is there will be something that you will do, Nick, that will cause you to stick your neck out a little bit. Like, um, for you, it would have been uh, when you're on the reality show, right? Mm -hmm. So you become noticeable. It, the the uh, analogy is on the playground, right? You're in the third grade and you have a lot of insecure kids playing on the playground. And one of the, kid comes, one of the kids comes to school with a weird hat or his mm -hmm. shoes are a little dirty or her hair is a little messy or whatever, just something that causes right. some identification of you're different in some way. Yeah. And then someone will say something, you know, someone that first, that first online the commenter. Spark. Yeah. Or that first kid on the playground will say, um, your hair's messy or something. Mm -hmm. And then, the crowd notices and we are not individuals. We are part of a system. We are part of a, of a society. We are part of a group and we are very susceptible to group think. And so we see that happen on the playground and we're like, Oh, so, and then we watch, right? right? So someone attacks the girl with the frizzy hair and then we watch 
And if no one, uh, if no one gets back, because what can happen is a bunch of people can get behind the frizzy haired girl and say, you're a bully. And then, and then we go, Oh, the bully is the target. So right. that, you know, but we're always looking like, where are they? Where am I? And so for you, Nick, you're on the show and you and Danielle start to have some issues that are on the show, right? You're starting right. to have some conflict. And so someone comes out and says, Nick is a narcissist or something. And Got then people, and then people watch, right? Subconsciously they're watching. If that person who said that will get attacked. If they don't, then we see, oh, so Nick is now, he's, he's free game. You can say whatever you want to about him. And I have so much latent uh, built up anger and resentment mm -hmm. towards my dad or my ex-boyfriend or society or me, maybe I hate myself that, you know what? Let's use Nick as a punching bag and let's go after him. Okay, how can I narrativize him in my brain to dehumanize him, to frame him in a way that justifies me going after him? So I'll, I'll second that. He's not only a narcissist, he's a malignant narcissist. And then <laughs> someone sees that. Now they see two people. And then, and then everyone starts to yeah. pile in and they're just pouring all their anger and all their resentment. And it doesn't last very long for them because – they just move on with their day. But when you add a uh, hundred thousand people for you, it just becomes this, you know, onslaught of, yeah. of attacking and, and people just move on with their day. You know, it's like, Oh, you know, th th these are early on. If you had asked me 10 years ago, I would have been like, well, all these people, they've got to be like disturbed individuals. No, these people, in fact, there was a, this American life episode about this, where they actually, <laughs> where, um, uh, Lindy West actually, I think, reached out to one of her online bullies, and and he was just a just a regular, mild mannered like accountant or something. Um, so, and, and uh, for other people who have experienced this, they've actually tried to figure out who their attackers are, and some of them are therapists. Some of the I mom, know, yeah, it's insane. You yeah. when you said that to me the other day, I I can't believe that. You know what I've noticed too? I feel I've noticed this lately with a lot of the you know, outspoken ways about how reality TV show contestants are treated. I've been speaking a lot about that. And I just keep getting the, you signed up for this argument. Yeah. You literally signed up for this. You literally signed up for this. And all I can think of to like find, and sometimes I'm snarky back in the comments and I'm working on it, but I can't help myself sometimes. And um, what I've noticed or what I think is going on is I think that people look at this and they're like, you got to be famous because there's such a, and I'm using air quotes for those who are, who are just listening. Um, they look at you and they're like, why not me? I could have survived that. I wouldn't be complaining about the 20 hour work days. I would have been just fine without food and water. I would have been just fine without mental health support during these excruciatingly high pressure situations that where every decision you make alters your life. I would have been fine. I would be a good reality star. I wouldn't be complaining. And I think that's what's going on. And I, and I see people say like that you signed up for this or some equivalent to that. And all I can think is like, I would just, I wouldn't wish this on you, even if you signed up for it. Mm -hmm. Like if you literally were like, I understand I'm not going to get access to food and water. I understand I'm going to work 18 to 20 hours a day. I understand because you don't, you actually don't unless you live it. But like people are just so angry and so yeah. so mad that they didn't get this opportunity or whatever you whatever however you want to put it yeah I, I there's a dehumanization of celebrities that is obvious when you see paparazzi and online bullying um they just think of you as untouchable they think mm -hmm. of you as above the normal concerns of life there's this obsession with fame and prestige that uh, elevates these individuals beyond human life. They, it, it, you know, you think, and I remember thinking this way when I was younger, like someone like Brad Pitt or a politician or something, you think, well, surely they go to bed just glowing in a, a, a you know, a vast sea of confidence and uh, just knowing about their accomplishments, knowing about how great they are. And little old me criticizing them isn't going to, isn't going to put a dent in that. 
Mm. But then you see uh, what it's really like for people and you hear them talk about what it's like for them. And you're like, oh, they're just like me. (laughs) Even though, yeah, they they have uh, potentially millions of people that are uh, even kind of worshiping them. Mm -hmm. They still are a human being. When they're criticized, when someone says something negative about them, it hurts their feelings and it, it gets on their nerves. Uh, Conan O'Brien, for example, he, he seems like a very level-headed guy. He's been in a lot of therapy. He is, um, he seems to be above a lot of stuff like that, but he's talked about on his podcast how for, for years now, he, he doesn't look at anything online mm-hmm. about him. He doesn't read a single comment and he hasn't even before when he was doing his TV show, uh, primarily he committed a long time ago that he was never going to read anything because it would, it ruined it for him. And uh, that just showed me like if Conan O'Brien can't, uh, can't uh, even read the comment section, so to speak, the metaphorical comment section of his content, then I think we're all, uh, uh, you know, any one of us, all of, all of those super famous people are, are sensitive. I don't know how, politicians do it i don't understand how super rich people do it like i I don't either but we also see a lot of people will become depressed they drink a lot you know amy winehouse these these kinds of people Mm -hmm. they will um have to go on retreats to another country and get away you know i i i get uh, uh the the necessity to protect yourself but you know, if you're a content provider and even a famous person, a politician, a, an actor, the reason why you got into it was because of the of the people. You you, you know, yeah. people don't get into acting just because they want to act in their room by themselves. They they want to know the audience reaction. So, uh, for you know, you you're, you're making a podcast. Uh, you do it for the listeners. You're not just yeah. sitting in a room, uh, recording. You're, you you want to provide something to, to people. You want to have some indication that you're providing something of value. And so you you have to let that in because otherwise it's Mm -hmm. meaningless. But then when you let that in, you open yourself up to the, the trauma of it all. Yeah. And I would say, I've said this before, but when I was going on the show, I'm, I was pretty confident in myself. I know who I am. I know I, I have my core values. I always try to just do the right thing. And I'm, that doesn't mean I'm always right, but I certainly have that as sort of my mantra. And I remember shortly before the show was coming out, I was kind of like, I'm, I'm, I don't feel touched by this. I will not be bothered by this. Then I was listening to Joe Rogan, which, you know, people have opinions on him. I don't agree with a lot of what he says and does, but I enjoy some of the conversations that he has. And he was talking about how he can't look at the comments. They're too mean. And I'm thinking to myself, Joe Rogan is like the hottest podcast in history. He is the former (laughs) literal host of Fear Factor. And he was a cage fighter who now commentates on cage fighting. And he can't look at the comments. And that was like the wake up call for me, similar to how you had yours. And I just think to myself, I'm like, man, like, I would never, I will, I will say stuff in the comments, but I will like never attack a person. Like yeah. I, I might attack what they do. Like if it's a politician, if they work on, you know, legislation, I don't agree with, or they don't do what they say they're going to do. Like, I think that's a, you know, that's a responsibility of, of me as a citizen, but to like yeah. go on and, and attack someone as a human being without yeah. really having any context, I just can't grasp it. I don't know if I ever identify this, but I'm always looking to relate because when I can relate, then I have a, an avenue to compassion. I have an avenue to change. And mm-hmm. that's what it's like to be a therapist. And so I'd never thought about this until you said that. Um, there's one moment, and there's probably more, but there's one moment where I can actually relate. I, uh, I, I, I won't identify the content provider that I, I, I love this content provider <laughs> a lot. and. Uh, I was uh, listening to the podcast and they said that they were making fun of people. They're not Facebook people, these people. Mm -hmm. And so they were making fun of people on Facebook who will uh, post like uh, happy father's day or happy mother's day. And they, they were saying that it was all performative and distasteful, you know, like, um, 
I don't know, just, you know, those sort of Facebook posts that are glowing about your mom or your dad or your kid or your husband, or you know, there, there's those kind of style of posts, you know, I love this man. He's always been there for me and um, that kind of thing. And they were uh, uh, framing it as performative and narcissistic and self-centered and uh, passe. And I had just done that on Facebook for my dad. <laughs> I had just made a post on <laughs> right. Father's Day uh, for my dad. This would have been, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. And it hurt my feelings so much. And this podcast I love so much. Mm -hmm. um, and But I'd never reached out. I'd never emailed them. I'd never um, commented. I'd never, because it's kind of hard to comment on a podcast anyway. Right. But I, I never felt enough energy to actually reach out. Well, in this moment, I was so incensed. You know, anger motivates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and hurt causes us to get angry. Pain causes us to get angry. So I was, I was hurt. And maybe it hit home a little bit, honestly, um, yeah, that I couldn't acknowledge at the time. But, you know, it was just very hurtful. And then I emailed them and I was... I was a dick. <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't have any, I mean, I, I probably softened it a little bit, right? but not a lot. And I, uh, uh, and, you know, and I don't consider myself to be that sort of person. I don't normally do that kind of thing, but in that state, you know, that state of hurt and anger, that's, uh, and especially when it's someone that you like, right? If it was a right. random podcaster that I heard, I'd be like, well, whatever. But these are people that, I look up to or depend on, or you almost feel like you have a relationship with them. Right. And so I did that. And, um, I don't know if I'd ever made that connection before. Cause it, like you, I've often been like, what would motivate someone to even do that? I mean, obviously I think other people have a lot more pain, a lot more fear, a lot more anger, um, or an itchy trigger finger when it comes to actually making those comments more so than, than you and I do. But but I think that's where it comes from for a lot of people. You know, back in the day, yeah. you think it's all trolls, right? It's all just people that are uh, pranking. But mm -hmm. and people still call them trolls. But I, you know, that's not an accurate term. That's people why I call them the the mob. It's not internet trolls. It's the internet mob. Right. And along those lines, I, in prep for our episode, I actually started looking into because I have notes on this. I've talked about this over the years and yeah. have uh, kept notes on the literature and the research in this area and. Um, and I did a little bit of um, lit review this morning, and there's not a name for this, a good okay. or, or a decided name. It, you know, there are names like cyberbullying, which doesn't really encapsulate it because it could just be one on one. You have things like mob mentality and, and herd mentality, but those can relate to positive movements, exactly, and, and aren't necessarily online. And you could say that it, it's a bully mob, but that doesn't emphasize the online online nature. So the, the term that I came up with was online bully mob because it's really the only all encompassing. Yeah, um, people will call them trolls, but again, unless you identify what you mean by trolls, it could be misunderstood as just pranksters. Right. So, so it's just kind of weird that we don't have that. I'm guessing in five ten years we will have a, an established term mm -hmm. for this phenomenon. I think. I think it's been happening for a long enough time, uh, at least, uh, obviously, since the internet began, but in earnest. Chat for, rooms. <laughs> yeah. But in, in earnest, or at least the way you've experienced it and I've experienced it, uh, maybe in the past 10 or 15 years, and yeah. at the degree that we have it today. But because it only happens to rare individuals, it's not a common experience, right? It, it doesn't happen to everyone. It only happens to people that actually garner an audience yep. that the set of people who have experienced is so small that there isn't a lot of talk about it. And because when you do talk about it, you'll get bullied more, particularly women, by the way, when women speak up about it, then the, then the bullies really pile yeah. on. Which right? I just don't understand that. Like you would not say these things to someone in real life in most cases. Yeah. Well, you wonder what people are thinking. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, that was one of my big takeaways I've realized from, from getting sort of a platform from being on love is blind is I was in my bubble. So, and I had made my bubble so comfy and 
you know, set up for me to be successful with the way I structure my days, the people I spend my time with, um, the people I don't spend my time with it took me a long time to get there. And I just didn't realize the point you keep emphasizing is how much trauma and pain there is out there mm-hmm. until this experience, until I have gotten it myself. I've saw, I saw stuff that Danielle got way worse than anything I've ever got. Like, and just going through that experience with her was, it was so eye opening to me to see that, wow, there are a lot of people out there that do not have the tools to, to have that luxury that I did to like spend time in therapy, spend time on myself Mm -hmm. and make sure that I set up a life that helps me be successful. People don't have that. They don't Mm -hmm. have access to the tools. They don't know where to get them in some cases. It's Mm -hmm. just, it's awful. And it, it just opened my eyes to see how many traumatized and hurt people there are out there. And let's be honest, there's a bell curve of intelligence. No, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it requires a, a, an analytic mind to walk yourself through these experiences. You're online, you have a reaction. And uh, if you just react emotionally or without much inner guidance on the morality or even the logic of mm-hmm. claiming such things, uh, you know, earlier when you were talking about the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial, we're talking about licensed uh, um, complaints and I did receive one and it was so, it, I mean, I don't know the state of mind. It was an anonymous complaint against my life. By the way, it went to the licensing board of my state and they didn't even look into it because on its, on its face that the complaint was essentially that I was uh, claiming to be a psychologist or I was claiming to be a doctor, but I'm not a doctor because I don't have a medical degree. I, I can't remember what it was, but Jeez. I have a doctorate. <laughs> yeah, literally, you said that earlier. Yeah. That makes you a doctor. Yeah. If you have a doc, and, and uh, to be clear, I believe the history is that originally medical doctors were not referred to as doctors. They were called something else. And the doctor part were people that had doctorates. Anyway, point is, is that to say someone's a doctor, we really should be using the word physician because anyone with a doctor is quote unquote a doctor. Anyway, Mm -hmm. so they made a complaint and long story short, the complaint was not, did not seem to emerge from intelligence. Let's just put it that way. (laughs) Because a simple Google uh, uh, search would have eliminated the basis for this complaint. It's alarming people don't even have the the moment to stop and be like, maybe I should Google this. Like yeah. I know when people people talk about me, it's like, did you have you looked at my Instagram profile? Spend fifteen seconds on it and this will be not true. Like yeah. it's just so I just don't get that, but I can't imagine like your licensure. Yeah. Now, you know, thank God the licensing board just looked at it and I don't know the full process, but from my understanding, my lawyer who specializes in that kind of malpractice told me that it's pretty rare that the state won't even look into something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, the fact that they didn't even look into it, they didn't even bother to investigate it, meant that um, to them it was just um, unfounded, At you know, obviously. You know, I, I don't want to say that people online are somehow unintelligent or something, but, you know, it is a factor. The average IQ is 100. <laughs> which is, you know, it, it, so there's a, that means average. So, you know, it's a fair amount of people with an IQ of 90 or 80 or something yeah. who, you know, it, it might just be a little harder for them to navigate these difficult emotional online worlds, you know? Right. Uh, in terms of coping, uh, cause you know, that should be touched on at some level. Yeah. Um, how have you coped with it? I have been hurt a lot by some of the things um, that have come in about me that aren't true. I, I mean, there was a lot of backlash online when the show first came out. I had people questioning my sexuality. I had people, um, you know, saying I was a narcissist, which we touched on earlier, or that there was clearly something going on because basically nobody's like that patient or that consistent or that whatever. And it was just all of these things and and people thinking I was like some sort of closeted psychopath, like all this horrible stuff. And all I, all I really like ever do 
is, is like, I make it a point to try and help other people. And it's just so, it's so damaging to see all of this stuff being said about you or even like some of the stuff, like as simple as, well, you don't look good. Oh, you, you know, Danielle deserves so much better. And I know she got that, you know, a hundred times more than I did, but it was just seeing this stuff and seeing the, the people speculate about like, so the speculating about my sexuality, that doesn't bother me because they're speculating about my sexuality. It bothers me for someone else who's maybe trying to figure that out. And now this has become like a, a form of an attack right. to, to question someone's sexuality. And that's not good for anyone who's struggling to, you know, come out or, or whatever it is that they yeah. are working towards. And it puts shame on people yeah. and it puts shame on people when you diagnose and you, you, the term narcissist is thrown around way too much. Um, but you know, people thinking they have the ability to just label you this stuff because of a few minutes on TV. And I, I, you know, for a while I stayed pretty strong with it and I just felt, you know, I know who I am. I know I do the best I can. These people don't know me. They're not my people and they can say and do whatever they want. Cause I never really care what people think about me anyway but it just, it does get to you. It, it does whittle down and, you know, going through a public divorce and, um, you know, <laughs> getting out there then after the whole mob who said you guys never should have been married in the first place. And then having all of them come back like that really got to me too, because they don't, they weren't in our relationship every day. They didn't know. And I don't, I don't, I don't like when other people comment on other people's relationship when they're in the public eye, like that actually mm. kind of does bother me. Um, mm. and then to have it be done by other people who like, one don't know one just watched an hour and 15 minutes of me on the show and then to even have some people who go who went through the experience having comments on our relationship like i don't i just don't get it and that's the one that that's when it really started to get to me because i'm just like i didn't do anything to anyone i did the best i could in my marriage they were talking as if they knew everything right they would make yeah. very certain comments like well, clearly, d d d d d. Uh, oh yeah, I got cheat. I got called a cheater um, yeah. because I was at brunch with my friend who was here from England, who had been planning to come for a long time. We weren't even alone. Yeah, we were in a group, and I was very careful not to be alone with her in public uh, because I didn't want any of that to happen, and I didn't want it. They went after her on yeah. her social media, and that happened yeah. to another one of my friends too because um, I posted that we hung out together, and the mob just like goes after them. And it's just, it's crazy to me. The the emotional toll is real. And we talked about it before. Are you still suffering a lot or have you found a way to sort of, what's the system of how to protect yourself? A lot of people listening already know, cause I talked about this. Like I lost my job shortly after our divorce. So I lost my insurance. I lost my fam, my new family. I lost my partner. I lost all this stuff. And then the mob was coming at me and I was, a, I was actually in a really dark place um, mm-hmm. that I'm still trying to come out of. But last December I had like, uh, I mean, I had to go off social media for over a week. I just couldn't do it anymore, especially with the holidays, which I get a little, I struggle with the holidays in general. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I'm still coming out of it. It's now I'm feeling confident, starting to feel more confident again. And that helps because then it just bounces off you when someone says something that isn't true. But when you're down in the dumps and it's everything hurts a little bit more. How did you get from December to now? I mean, I'm on step one. I think I just got up off the floor, <laughs> maybe known as rock bottom. But, um, you know, I, I just try to f- spend time talking to the people that know me and spend time with my circle Mm -hmm. so that I can get, it's so silly to say this, but like just that reassurance that, Mm -hmm. you know, I do have friends. I do have Mm -hmm. people in my life that matter. Like I, I am not defined by a failed reality TV relationship. That's part of who I am, but that does not define me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the hardest parts to just sort of think about and reflect on to overcome. I also, I, journal. I've always journaled since I was a young kid, but I've been doing a lot more journaling since then, which helped to, um, you know, gratitude, practicing gratitude, trying to tell people when I'm grateful for them, or I appreciate them. Mm -hmm. Um, setting intentions is another one that's really helped me. Like, what do I want to get 
done today or what do I want to get out of today? So just some basic level stuff like that. Even with the, the gratitude, I, I would be like, well, why did this happen? And it happened because people love you and they care about you and, you know, you appreciate them and stuff like that. So that's all kind of helped, but I'm still coming out of it. Mm -hmm. And now with it's coming again with, um, you know, starting the you can foundation, the unscripted mm -hmm. cast advocacy network, because now it's the, well, you signed up for it. Oh, you're just, you know, big, the bully himself, the OG Nick Viles, you know, calling me a, a motherfucker. And then <laughs> what, and what, then, did he, what did he, Oh do? yeah. So he, he, on his show, I think two weeks ago, he said that this foundation was, was, um, I forget exactly what he said, but he, ca he called me a motherfucker for starting it and then said, um, that I was only doing this because my star was dimming and this was the only way that I could stay relevant because I couldn't monetize my platform. Mm. And I'm like, as you know, every single person who starts a not-for-profit to help people usually gets rich and famous. Like it just didn't make any sense. And he got a lot worse than I did, um, you know, to the point where he shut his comments off because people were, were going after him for his, his, you know, horrible take. Um, but it did send a whole new mob of people that were mean about my relationship, about starting this foundation, about mental health and all sorts of other stuff. And I hear too, from people like, Oh, you're just trying to steal your, your ex-wife's thunder. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, you can go back to the beginning of my, like Instagram, there's pictures of me talking about wellness or stories about like how important it is to walk. Like, it's just crazy. They don't know. Nobody takes a minute to research. Nick Vile even said on his sh show that all of his listeners did the research on the foundation for him. So it's, and me, like, dude, just hop on my page and you'll see I've been an activist. I'm, I work in my community. I just worked to get our mayor elected. So that, that resent the mob. And I, this is how I know I'm taking step in the right direction. Cause it's not bothering me mm. because I know I'm doing the right thing with the foundation. Mm. And so that, that was the first, when I, cause I was worried about taking the brunt of all of this being, you know, sort of the executive director of outreach, but the face of this to start off, at least until we get other people, but I'm, I'm proud. And that's how I know I'm feeling good because it isn't bothering me. And some of them are brutal, but it isn't bothering me. Like I was worried it was going to bother me. Mm. Yeah. Purpose. Uh, I suppose yeah. I can relate. Um, I started my career as a therapist and as a podcaster to make the world a better place or try. Yeah. And that purpose, I guess, is similar to what you're talking about. It yeah. like, it's like, well, I know I'm in the flow. I know I'm in the, um, yeah, I, I'm on the path mm -hmm. to goodness. If, if this didn't have any meaning or any purpose, if there was no point, if there was no higher reason to do this, mm -hmm. then it would, uh, there wouldn't be any reason to push forward, you know, and there wouldn't be anything you could fall back on to reassure yourself yeah. that, um, that you're, you're a good person and you're, you're trying to make a difference. You're trying to make a positive difference. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you have that. Yeah. Thank you. I'm very, I'm very proud and I'm Taurus and I'm stubborn. So when someone, when I know I'm doing the right thing and someone comes after me, like I get stronger. So that's also been, I mean, I was not expecting him to say anything, but I'm glad that he did when it helped the foundation get a lot more publicity than we ever expected at that early stage. But, um, you know, he gave me some conviction so that that was good. How did you get out of yours? You said you're doing much better now. Um, but I am curious, like, was there a moment like that for you where you're like, oh, I'm feeling better? Or has it just been slow and gradual? What were some of your tactics? It's a lot. Um, my wife was there for me every day. Uh, there was this pinnacle where I, I still have the image in my head of um, we were in the kitchen and I was just, you know, having a, I was just kind of rambling about what was happening online. And, and she's a part of, she uh, helps me out with the podcast a lot. So she mm -hmm. knew about it probably more than I did, honestly. I can't remember the exact sequence, but I, I started to cry or she looked at me with, with compassion, you know, like you, you could see that she felt my pain mm -hmm. and yeah, I just started crying and she comforted me, you know? And so that's a emblematic of a lot of things that happened with me and my yeah. wife. 
uh, for months around there. But I think that was kind of a turning point where instead of trying to push it away or trying to combat it, or I don't know, I, I just uh, fell into a place that I like to be, which is to just acknowledge the pain and to reach out and to, yeah. to not know what to do. You know, you, we, we don't always know what we're doing. Well, and there's so, no blueprint for that either. Yeah. And getting doxxed. Yeah. And so I think that was a turning point for me. And then another thing that I did, uh, and that set a theme for how to cope with it. of just like, you know, that, okay, you know, do what you can, but if it hurts, it hurts. And there might not be a solution to it other than just to feel the hurt and to ask for support. Mm -hmm. Um, another part of it was that I, uh, started to talk about it on the podcast and the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I, I did a, a series of episodes at the end of the whole Johnny Depp Amber Heard series of episodes where I read every email and I got, a, or, or at least most of the emails and you know, many of them were neutral or positive, but there were some real negative ones. Of course. And, and normally if there are negative emails that are, you know, really attacking me, I will either not read it or kind of glance at it and, and run away. But <laughs> um, what this made me do is I not only had to read it, but I had to really digest it and mm -hmm. live with it and respond to it and process it. And that helped too, because it made it less scary, you know, yeah. when it's at something at arm's length and I'm like, Ugh, you know, then it, it always has that power. But if I just sort of let it in, and, and, and this is something that as a therapist, I learned a long time ago, which is if a client, for example, is upset at you, that's abhorrent. That's very mm -hmm. horrible to any therapist. We get into this career because we're trying to be helpful. And if a client actually is upset at us, it's, it's really, um, a shock to the system. So there's a tendency to reject or to defend or to uh, conceptualize, diagnose, so yeah. obviously there's something wrong with you. Instead of just judoing it or being a Buddhist about it and just accepting, it's like, okay, <laughs> right. what's going on? You know, uh, 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 tell me more. And I might not agree, but, but let's let's embrace reality. This is a part of my life. You know, I, I, I was trying to say, well, I want the neutral and positive comments. I'll let those in, but I don't want those things to come. So mm -hmm. allowing them to come in, I don't know. It, it was weird. It, it gave me a chance to apologize too. You know, I, I, I would apologize. There were people on both sides that were hurt by me and I would apologize to them and sincerely and um, would take responsibility for not, you know, being more careful uh, at times. I, I don't remember everything I said, but you know, that helped. Mm -hmm. And then I, I think another thing that helped was um, I, I did a deep dive on a personality disorder called a obsessive compulsive personality disorder. It's not, it's not really anything like obsessive compulsive disorder, which a lot of people will be somewhat familiar with where you're right. obsessed with cleaning your hands or something like this. You know, it, it's an oversimplification of course, but OCD is that well, um, obsessive compulsive personality disorder is a completely different thing. Essentially, it has to do, in my conceptualization, with flaw shame, where people are ash deeply of ashamed of flaws, being imperfect in some way because of right. early childhood traumas. And as I'm doing this deep dive, I was just randomly doing this deep dive. About halfway through, I figured out I have a mild version of this. <laughs> Mm. Uh, not a, not a severe, but you know, I, I, I have a, I have a perfectionistic, uh, theme in my personality right. and I started, you know, and this is right after the trial that I'm doing this deep dive and I'm really, I'm thinking about the deep, I'm thinking about the trial a lot and I'm thinking, uh, and I have a long history of this where I won't bother you with like, I, I, early in my career, I had trouble with negative feedback as a professor. It would really mm. just highly stressed me out if a yeah. student wrote a bad review about me after the course was over. Um, and I found that other professors seemed to handle it uh, much better than I did. And so for me, I figured that out. Long story short, uh, I was able to conceptualize it and take care of myself and know a more direct route to health and mentally mm. for me, because, you know, when I have that feeling, I'm like, okay, is my perfectionism kicking in? 
because I might have to reframe that in my mind in terms of like, it's okay to be imperfect. It's okay to have right. flaws. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to have some people that just don't get you or hate you or, you know, it, it doesn't mean that the whole thing needs to be torn, torn down. Right. 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 So that's such a level of self-awareness that I don't think, I, I mean, it's like a learned skill to be able to do that. A lot of therapy and a, and a yeah. lot of, uh, you know, thinking about it, contemplation right. about it. Right. Um, before we go, what's one thing you would say to anyone who thinks they may be um, susceptible or in an online bully mob to, to sort of maybe reassess some of their actions? I guess uh, the only thing that comes to mind, I'm sure there's a long list, but the only thing that comes to mind is in terms of what you were saying earlier, which is um, look into it, <laughs> you know, before you say something, look into it. Yeah, that's a good one. And then I would say, check yourself. Is this about them or is this about me? Hmm. That's yeah. what I would. Yeah, what am I? That's what, what I would recommend. What <laughs> am I going through? <laughs> yeah, a barometer. Like, I wonder if I'm suffering and I'm not taking care of myself. Well, thank you for coming on. We'll have to have you on again. We'll talk about something else going on in the mental health space or, um, you know, psychology. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you so much. Where can people find you and your show? YouTube, Psychology in Seattle. We'll put the links in the description here, but make sure you check out uh, Dr. Kirk's show. And thank you again for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Eyes Wide Open. If you enjoy the show, the best way to support us is by sharing or dropping a review. For more information and content, check out engagewithnick.com or find me on Instagram at nthompson513. Don't go through life blind. Do the work so you can show up in the world with your eyes wide open.